My name is CCR Chagra, and you are now listening to uh, the working title is In Conversation With. And uh, we are with, uh, he just gave me his name, his little while, so I know his first name is Chris. That's right. And, and then my there's. last name is like a bow on a door. Chris Bodor. Chris Bodor. Chris Bodor. Chris Bodor. Say it three times fast, and then maybe your memory is better than mine. Okay, Chris Bodor. Uh, we are at the National Beat. Poetry Festival in the northwest corner of Connecticut. This is, uh, the, I think, about the tenth year that this festival has existed. This is the third year that I've been here, um, and we, I'm surrounded by people who were uh, interested in Debbie Kilday's vision of uh, reintroducing that there are a modern wave of of poets that are of the beat generation, and that beat literature. Is 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 a, is a is a birth seed that happened, and it is still growing, and it is still blossoming, and it is not stuck in some sort of small-minded. Oh, this is who the beats were. This is what they did, and now they're done. Not even at all. So Debbie's vision is to say that that was a child, and it is now 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 200 years old, and we are on that arc. And these individuals here believe that they are in that wave of uh, uh, not really not competing. I'm going to say that out loud. I don't, this is not a competitive sport. And these are people who have given their lives maybe 10, 20, or 30, or 40 years of their lives already or more to uh, being influenced by this seed child known as the beat movement or beat literary movement. And so in the future, I just might have conversations with people who are intellectuals, whether, whether they're physicists or painters or anything like that. But here and now, to begin with Ron Whitehead, and when you hear his story, which is what happened in the first interview, is my participation in that conversation was to be a really good listener because he has a story to tell. And names to drop, but he's not dropping names, he's dropping wisdom, and there just happened to be names in the story of his wisdom. And so go back to the first one, watch each one, it's all different. All you gotta do is go to uh, Google and type in Chris Bodor, B-O-D-O-R. It's a Hungarian name. B-O-D-O-R, B-O-D-O-R, this is for them. I'm gonna need it again, and okay. Basically, the way it's explained to my dad, um, the name in Hungarian means curly, but not like, you know, uh, your hair. It's like a wisp of smoke that goes up a chimney, and that is Bodor. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, you know, that's that's my lineage, and uh, so... Okay, so we're going to go yeah. a human, alien, and beyond in this conversation, mm -hmm. or we're going to go there. I don't know. So, any place you want to start, or do you want me to drop a seed of some sort? Well, how did I get here? How did I get here? So my first question to Chris Bodor is... Where are you now? Man, I, I just got to do 15 minutes in front of people who lifted me up, man. Push that door close for me a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. So, you know, being at this festival, I'm here because... Um, you read, but they lifted you is what you said. Well, no, they lifted me to this um, platform. Uh, I've been lifted to this forum to um, present my work and then take the distinction of Florida Beat Poet Laureate for the next two years and bring it back to Florida. And now the stuff I've been doing for 35 years, like right out of high school, putting pen to paper, going to open mics, you know, that whole repetition and trying to get published and having open mics and now I'm coordinating St. Augustine Poetry Festivals and now with this elevation being named by people I didn't even know, it's a another level. It's like... They just found you. They did, yeah. Wow. And, I mean, I mean, let's think about the beat poet laureate like what the heck is that yeah good question All right, you know so amanda gorman spoke at the inauguration uh and she was the youth u.s 
poet laureate. Well, that means that... Of the, of the, of the beat thing? No. Oh, no, no, she just was. Okay. Yeah, she, of the United States. Yeah, Amanda Gorman, a young, talented poet, was invited to the Biden inauguration. Okay. And suddenly all eyes were watching a brilliant... Oh, this is, this is the little black girl. That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. I so, should have known that, that, but she was given that opportunity right. because she was the current U.S. youth poet laureate. So that's a government appointing type of thing. It was like the U.S. Congress appointed her, right. and um, but I'm sure she had to apply. I'm sure she had to, you know, be uh, in competition with other yeah, youth yeah. who are just as talented. Yeah. But with Debbie and what the, what uh, she is, it's the beat poet laureate from different states and so forth. Right. And they go and find us. I mean, when they named um, the Hungary, uh, for the country of Hungary, they have a lifetime beat poet laureate. And the way, like... Is it a guy? It's a guy, yeah. Is his name Gabor? G G no, Gabor. Gabor, yeah. yeah. He was and, here last year. Oh, I know. I and, 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 and I interviewed him. He sat on his couch. A different yeah. project called Docu Dialogue okay. is another project I have. And, and Gabor was one of the first people. It was an experiment in no communication. Okay, well, no. but he's very talented and his English is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm almost yeah. positive we're talking about the same no, guy, just we in case. are. Okay. We are. And... Um, Big guy. Yeah, yeah. a very uh, large stature, but um, the yes. way he explains it, because, you know, someone interviewed him and like, oh, wow, you're, you're the uh, lifetime uh, beat poet laureate for Hungary, you know, how did you get that distinction? And I thought he was very eloquent the way he explained it. He's like, these people found me and have named me, and there's so much honor in that because... Yeah. When the title of Poet Laureate, when it's on a government platform, there's taxpayer money attached to it. All there's kinds politics, of politics. There's agendas. Oh. And I thought... I, I call could, that the what's in it for me factor. Yeah, and I thought that maybe I could aspire to that after all these years. If I've been running an open mic in my city every last Sunday since August of 2009, uh -huh. that should give me enough credibility in the area uh -huh. to just give the guy a title type of thing. You know, yeah. make, a, make a poet laureate program, give it to Chris, then let Chris figure out how future poet laureates will be. Um, and is that, is that what they said? No. Um, they said we'd prefer to have someone else do it, and, okay. and so then, then this happened. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I, I just love being here. <laughs> well, and if I didn't say so, we are. I did say so. We're at the National Beat Poetry uh, Festival in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and uh, and Debbie Kilday is is the uh, executor founder of this. Uh, it's an LLC. It, yeah. it is. It's straight up on the title, and. Um, this is the kind of work she's doing. And as much as you could be uh, critical, and I think this is a good time to say this, as yeah. much as you could be critical about this poet laureate of the United States, girl that influenced you and the youth poet yeah. laureate, and all the politics that comes with that, that also comes with a lot of critique from people who have lived the life and walked the walk yeah. and have never been recognized. There's a certain angst that you have to get past as a poet uh -huh. to not be jealous or envious of the world acknowledging or recognizing you. And one of the things that Debbie has done every time I've ever seen her is that she is about doing the opposite of that. Yeah. She is about finding the voices that are not heard but deserve to be heard. And that is her understanding of that the stigma that has been, that has been attached to beat poetry uh, over the years from the media, you know, the dirty hippies and stuff like that, you know, get a job, cut your hair, you know, all these other little things that happened during that generation where children started to think for themselves and blew their parents' reality out of the water and questioned it, thanks to Vietnam and thanks to early media before, you know, the, and rock and roll and, and, and the slave song, R&B, jazz, the blues, 
rock and roll. There's a tree there that goes back to you can't take away our voice. And B, I think, in my little humble opinion, is in that tree. And that tree can't be killed. Civilizations could die, but that tree is going to come back. And I think that's one of the things that Debbie has done. It. If yeah. it comes with some politics and some stigma, those are the slings and arrows that came with her decision to, uh, to make this uh, a business. But at the same time, I think as long as the founder and her heart is at it, how she hands this off is probably going to be one of the, one of the uh, trials of, of whether or not uh, the integrity of her vision can be upheld. And I think that's true with every artist. And one of the reasons that I'm here also is because in the book, and if you don't mind, this is a conversation. So I'm in the book this year because I, I wrote a poem cool. about, I was in the documentary, Who Owns Jack Kerouac, Jack Shea. And, and Jack Shea was one of the first people to say you. And he gave me a quote out of nowhere. I didn't know him. He goes, one of the most, uh, he gave me some nice, in America of all the poems. So he came to America. He was in, uh, Jack Shea was in uh, London. I and there see. was a school. Okay. And the school opened the film school. And he was at the onset nexus of that. I don't know if it was named after him or not. But he decided he didn't want to do that. Even though, even though he was like at the nexus of it. Yeah, so he yeah. decided to just up and leave that. He got in touch with this person who wanted to go with him. He flew to America and lined up a 50-stop tour of people who knew Jack Shea okay. and who knew the story of Jan, his daughter. Okay. So Jan was friends with my friend Buddha Paroli, uh, Buddha, H-A, instead of A-H. Oh, okay. and, and John Paul Paroli was in this documentary, and it was about what happened to Kerouac when he died. Oh, yeah, yeah. And his will and the typewriter. Yep. And, and Gerald Nicosia and his work and how he got locked out of his own work yep. and how even even uh, even uh, even the Kerouac Foundation this documentary is now wiped from the internet as far as I can see there are bootleg copies still floating around okay. and the wife I don't know where the rights of or it, it is but whenever it surfaces it seems to have there's a power structure that wants to push this down but the documentary is about you can't do that the documentary is about here's Jack okay. here's his ashes Here's his daughter's story that he denied. Here's what happened to both of them. They're dead. So Buddha kept coming to me and said, write a poem about it. I go, oh, fuck you. I don't write poems because somebody told me to. Oh, but I went home and I had an epiphany and I took Jan Kerouac because I'm listening to him. Jan's getting sick. Jan's dying. Jan's yeah. living on a poem a day. Yeah. Fucking potatoes. Uh, Ginsburg is her godfather and threw her out of her father's memorial when she went yeah. to go see it. She was an abandoned daughter. She had a rough childhood. And now they're taking, and now she's living on no money. And the Kerouac Foundation cut off her funds uh, to, to her, her book, Baby Driver, and some uh, other one. And they're good prose books. She was a good writer. Yeah. She only met her father twice in her life. So he puts all this information into the documentary and actually gets an interview with Sampus. Oh, wow. And the story of Jack Kerouac, his three wives, and uh -huh. his will. And then all the court cases, which yeah. is not even in the documentary, the number, where it went to the, I think it went uh -huh. to the Supreme Court. It's a huge thing. Oh, I know. But in the documentary, he ends it, especially in the early versions. I think there are cut versions and early versions of this. I happen to have a VHS okay. uh, of, of one of the earlier ones. And he, in this documentary, ends it where the entire thing, what matters is that you cannot kill the voice. You can't even own him as an icon and a product and an AI and go see Jack Kerouac at a museum. Okay. He's going to be, he's gonna be a, 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 a hologram and, and then they just mark it and then own all of it. Uh -huh. And it, all that money goes into one place because they've branded fame. They've sure. branded a poet. And they and they and they're gonna now and now they're gonna get a cash register at the at the corner of it, and behind that cash register is gonna be a foundation, and that foundation is gonna be what money laundering in the end. And uh, some of them, okay, these are hard words, but this is an open interview. Yeah. So and that's where we are. So that's what this dialogue is about. Is sure, it gives us sure. a chance to say something. And I'm I'm uh, uh, voicing up on this is the second time that I've kind of like jumped in on it, uh, but uh, but it's an important. You invoked it. You know, yeah. because because the, because the importance of him being here, yeah. the importance of him getting recognized, him getting a tap on the shoulder from life. It's like there are 3D angels. You, uh -huh. you don't have to wait. If Debbie's doing angel work, 
At the same time, she doesn't want to get screwed over by people who have money and control. Maybe she decided to play inside that world in order to not be played. She's to a certain degree, but her integrity is, is steering the ship. Yeah. She's steering the ship of this whole thing. And so uh, that's where it is. That's where it's going. And there's been nothing but beautiful people showing up. And everyone that I've met here has the same gratitude as what he's saying. It's like... Some, and, I, and I can mention my friend Ken Field at this point in time. He was an individual when I was just doing poetry out of nowhere. Oh, wow. and he, had this, okay. he had this jazz band. Okay. And every, every uh, uh, Thursday night, he had from 11 till 1 in the morning, he had wow. uh, this, he, the Board of Education. He got seven guys and he stood them up, drummer, sax, bass uh -huh. player, guitar, you got keys, whatever. He stuffed them onto this little stage that, and he stood in front. The name, the board yeah, the of Board of Education yeah, was the name awesome. of it. And he did this for two hours. And I was driving horse carriage, and so I got out of horse. And I, if I, it was Thursday night, I grabbed my camera equipment, I packed me yeah. it, and then I get on the train. And if I was out by nine, because Thursday sometimes you get out early, and if I'm lucky, I would show up at eleven, and then he would let me write from eleven to twelve, wow. take a break, and then when he came back, he let me get up and read what I just wrote. Oh my goodness! And I did this, and that wow. got me into the Zen Bastards, another sure. experimental project. And in that time, uh, the, the most deaf. And Brooklyn yep. was coming up with the Poetry Jam, and that was happening. But in Boston, it, it, Jeff Robinson decided to start uh, the Jeff Robinson Trio, and they just did a 25th anniversary. Every Sunday, a jazz band backing the whole thing. Okay. All these stories, and I can't get into the details, and I'm sorry if I'm missing pieces right now, but it has to do with poetry and art comes up from the bottom. But didn't you find it was so exciting when you had that audience like you were told you were the way you're explaining to me is you got to write for an hour yes and then someone said we want to hear what you've written and they knew nothing okay. about what i was going to write and that happens exactly. both with the board of education and with the with the zen bastards so for project. me i was riding a train in from where i lived in beacon new york uh -huh. into new york oh, city you know dave I do. Hey, man. Oh, yeah. I, just, I interviewed him last time he was here. That's fantastic. I got to go see him. We had David, but also we had um, Pete Seeger was uh, oh. a uh, celebrated uh, beacon. So you knew Pete? So, well, I saw, knew Pete, saw him play banjo, and uh, just like all, like right there. And, yeah. You know, uh, there was one. So, he's he an approachable human being. If you walked up yeah. to Pete as a human being, which I did oh, not yeah. do. But this is one of the conversations we had, especially sure. with Ron, that his mother taught him through life, whenever you meet a person, never look up to them and never look down on them. And he's oh. done that. And when I met him, that's the feeling I got. I'm going to say what I'm going to treat him like a human being and a sure. person. Even though I want to and I'm tempted to, oh, please acknowledge me, talk to me, say something. Or I'm going to say something controversial because I'm not as good as you. And those things don't matter. And what I did, uh, and the same thing happened with Dave. And okay. the same thing happened when I met Jack Shea. Yep. And the same thing happened when I met Steven Tyler. And the same wow. thing happened when I met uh, um, uh, Patty LaBelle's husband, Armstead uh -huh. Edwards, and, and Bruce Bingsting's producer. They're people. And I and, and 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 in the first one of these things right here, uh, uh, and he, please go back. I'm I'm gonna keep telling this second time I've said this, but go back to the first one and watch all these. They're all different. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he said uh, about what his mother said and about you know never look up or down. Yeah, there yeah. was something that happened, and I don't want to be lied to, and I don't want to lie to myself. Yeah. And it's in there, and isn't that where the poetry comes from in the end? Yeah, but so I didn't, let me let's I go let's go deep. That. Where does the poetry <laughs> come from? Now, see, wait, wait till you it, see the book. I'm gonna yeah, get you. This well, is I mean, a study of free speech. It's yeah. published as a social science book. So it's like, where does the poetry come from? So I couldn't stand poetry when I was in high school. I didn't want to study it in school, but I did have a teacher who was like, "We're going to study this song called The End by a band called The Doors." We're going to study this song called The Sound of Silence by um, uh, Simon, Simon and Garfunkel. And, and then also like uh, uh, a Bruce Springsteen song off of the Nebraska album. Which one? Um, I don't know because okay. I, I, that, 
Bruce never really spoke to me. Okay, go on. Uh, but Simon and Garfield, yeah. for sure, and Sound man, and Jim. And so we got to analyze what does 20th Century Fox mean? What does the end mean? And, you know, what does Sound of Silence mean? And it was like, wow, I learned that those people were poets and I totally dig what they were, you know, making as, you know, they affected... What did they do? What What is it that they did? So if you, without using the word poetry, yeah. those words in you, what did it they clicked, do? Finally. They clicked. Because it was outside of So when they clicked in you, yeah. I'm going to ride this horse for okay. When they clicked in you, where did they click in you and how? It, Describe that. It, it stirred my heart. It, it made me uh, identify in a way that the ivory towers or the classroom never could. I, I just didn't dig this Henry, I mean, this, Wordsworth yeah, so and this, Sylvia Plath and yeah. all that. And it's like, I just don't, you know, feel this. Yeah. Uh, but then when it was like, hey, did you know that every song on the radio is poetry in some way? Then it was like, oh, I can get into this. But I brought it into college wanting to be a filmmaker. I wanted Ooh. to tell stories, all right? I didn't want to do poems. I didn't want to write books. I wanted to tell stories. And how can I tell a story? It's got to have a beginning, middle, end. You heard my poetry today. I set something up, then there's a plot change halfway through, then a conclusion, the character has changed. This the is your voice, this is yeah. how you write. But it, that's, that's it's screenwriting, that's screenwriting yeah. 101. Wow, wow. It's 30, 30, 30. That's how do you, better. oh man, I want to get back on the other horse when I'm going to have to follow this one. How do you handle the necessity of conflict versus the uh, need to open the mind I need... Is it a good question? Uh, yeah, I okay. need to tell a story that someone can identify with because they've given me three minutes of their time. That's valuable. Okay. They could have walked by, but they stopped and they listened to what I had to say. That is an honor yes. that I have. Yeah. And, and I'm not taking anyone hostage. And how dare I spend three minutes of their time confusing the shit out of them. Right. Saying something that, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You might yeah. as, It's Greek to me or what yeah, have yeah, you. Yeah. And so how about I stick with every man stuff? How about I stick with stuff that blows through gender because everyone's had a relationship so they can relate to that. Or everyone... Oh, someday we got to talk again on what to do with yeah. the word he and she and it, but that's it another conversation. Matter, no, but how yeah. you do it, that's that's not uh, easy sometimes. I don't know because... <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I don't just, know. I'm just a guy. I asked an answer. I'm just a guy. I don't know what it likes, what it's like to be a no, woman. No, no, okay, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the problem right now, I don't think, is about gender. I think it's about pronouns fucking people over because they're limited. But I'm a, I'm a journalist and oh, when you journalist use, filmmaker, when you poet. use the word that's a nice they, combo. Yeah. It's like, there's a bunch of people, it's they, right? Yeah. Oh no, there are a bunch of people in my head, in my body, or what have So happened. where's them if they are in it, your head and body? Where's I don't them? know, man. Oh, I love I this! Know. I love this! Two I don't know's in a I row! Mean, my in. radio show for three and a half years, the name of it was? Yeah. The I Do Not Know Show. Oh, the I see. The tagline, yeah. in the middle of the night, in the middle of the weekend, on um, the middle of your forehead. The I Do Not Know Show, radio is art. Yeah, yeah. Three and a half years, from 1.30 until 3 a.m. Oh, that's Prime boring. time. <laughs> yeah, that's bewitching hour. Yeah, it was uh, right fun. It was experimental. Uh, radio is art. I called it experimental radio. It's exciting. It was man. fun. It was fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I brought you up to, like, my college experience where um, I started to, uh, you know, I went from high school learning about rock lyrics and I went on this filmmaker path to tell stories yeah. and then Barfly came out, okay? So uh -huh. that's Charles Bukowski wrote the screenplay, Babette Schroeder made the movie and it was basically a story of all the kind of Bukowski stuff in a 90 minute movie and Mickey Rourke played right. 
Charles Bukowski and he was getting in bar fights and he was, you know, I don't like people. Uh, I just feel I better when they're not around. And, and it was like, and, and I just like, I was like, are you telling me that there is a poet in the world who gets published and drinks excessive amounts and gets in bar fights and then gets published in other countries. So I totally got sucked in to that idea that Bukowski can be the patron saint of the labor poet. Like anyone Whoa. can booze up after working a, a hard job. Shit job and, in the real world. And write and, and pour their heart out into a typewriter or puke up words in onto the page, you know. And I rode that train for t 10 years. I would crack open a beer in New York City, get out my notebook, and when I arrived in Beacon after, you know, a hard day's commute, I would have something in my notebook. And then after a year, I typed up those poems. I was like, I'm a poet because I have 60 poems. I, I, you know, I guess I'm a poet because I'm writing poetry. And when I typed up those 60 poems, something cosmic happened. My brother fired the person who was doing the open mic at his cafe on the Lower East Side. Your brother had an open mic and he fired the host? Yeah. Go on. At the Lower East Side in, in the right room. Where? At the, it was called that... Old Dot Coffee. So it was internet, uh, like computers, yeah. comfy chairs, and coffee. So it was the three C's, and you go down on uh, Al Avenue A, right near St. Mark's. And so he's like, Chris, you got all these poems that you've so been you writing. you living in New York? No, I was oh. living in Beacon, okay, riding so the, train oh, the train in now. Okay. For, uh, for 90 minutes one way, right, right, right. so three hours round trip. Right. So my own brother's like, here's a mic, go run the open mic. See. And I did that for 14 months. Uh, I would do it every other Thursday, like in the evening, so we had that evening vibe going. And I would just crash at his place. And then I would go to work in the morning. I was working on 23rd Street. That was the whole deal with the commute. Okay. So, uh, you know, I cut my teeth as a spoken word artist, came out of my shell as a spoken word artist on the Lower East Side, where Lou Reed was. And, yeah. and, uh, Did you know Paul Skiff? No, no. Okay. But, uh, New Eurekan Poets Cafe, you ever go there? Yeah. I, I They're just, closing, you know. Yeah, and they, they've had a very strong online presence during yeah, COVID. Yeah, now they do. Yeah. I go. Yeah. It's one of my yeah. havens right now. Yeah, it's it's the cream of the crop. And, uh, well, it's, but, it's, uh, it's no matter the fact that poetry venues are in the... Even nonprofits are are still stuck under the thumb of making money, yeah. and when a brick and mortar like New Yorkian, yeah, that's uh, with the name poet in the name of the cafe, which sure, is, sure. I mean, it's one thing to be a venue; it's another thing to have the word poet in your name, and then because they have the principles of its founder, yeah, that it, that it it will never be uh, a home of censorship. Yeah. At the same time, they have a philosophy of the boot, where if you harm somebody, you're out. Yeah. So very few inclusive places have that protective layer of skin where you stand up for the for the love and the integrity of the open mic. And for some reason, as of now, since I've been involved in them, that's a pretty uh, uh, high wire act that they're pulling off right now. So yeah. as far as them being the cream of the crop, I think it's just attracting people because because the love is literally there, the support system sure. is there, and the way that they manage the host, I'm going to give it up for that. That venue because they may not have been that way and they may not last that way but right now they are they are dancing on that high wire and uh, and it's archives through this period uh, it's last year before it closes for three years um, is, is a testimony to what free speech is capable of doing inside an open microphone yeah, but and, yeah. and it is drawing talent but it's also giving huge love to newbies huge love yeah. so and that's just a that, that, that the fact that they're doing both at the same time to put why things, I'm bothering with that. Yeah, but to put things in context, I it was um, it was um, back in uh, 2003. That's when I first started working on 23rd Street and riding the train in, 
and then my brother gave me that opportunity and so I'm talking about running and every other Thursday open mic in 2003-2004. Was it all poets or music too? Oh no, all poets. Comedy, and anything? Nothing. We had one guy who, would, who was a stand-up comedian, but he hung out at my brother's cyber cafe, and he would come on, and he goes, Hey, how about that, Bukowski? I'll tell you, you know, everyone can drink a beer and think they're a poet. Boo-hoo-hoo. And he would, like, make fun yeah. of poets and do a little I got to give you my favorite Bukowski line that I carry in my heart and What's in my hip pocket, uh -huh. and that is... Uh, uh, I forget how I forget where it was I saw, it, but he said, "Ah, poets, schmoets, hoets." He goes, "You get up every day and you and you and you and you take a you take a hot beer shit and you look down in the bowl and you say, look what I did! I made something today.'" Yeah, yeah. And that that just sums it up for me as far as the ego of the poet. It's yeah. like we're a tube within a tube. That's and what it. did you do today? Did you make something? Uh -huh. You know, did you piss and shit a work of art? Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, even if it's just one turd, is that, did you do something? Did you make something? I know. And if you're going to hang your your ego on your hat, what a fucking humble fucking hat to hang it on, a shit bowl in the turd. Well, you take that analogy. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Everyone <laughs> shits, right? Yeah. All right? So everyone can be a poet if they write a if poem. If you could right? shit, you could write a poem. That's right. Oh, my God. I think but isn't it horrible that people have to listen to your shit, <laughs> see your shit, and be subjected to your smelly shit yeah. with you up at the mic saying, look how proud I am of this thing that everyone does. I do it too. You know, in, so, my, in my other project, The Word Show, one of the episodes, only two recorded so far, they're not released. Paul Skiff said, no, no matter how you cut it, when you go to an open mic, just be honest about yourself. When you get up to the mic, in order for you to do your best, you basically got to drop your pants. Yeah. You're going to be exposed. Yeah. And, and my book is all about that. Uh, 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 Cobalt Poets, Rick Looper, uh, called that the good, the bad, and the Arshagra. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, he does good work in California. Man, you know he, him? Well, I just know of him. Did, have you ever, did you ever go to Steve Cannon's? He's not here no more. I know. I was published by some of Steve's imprint back in the day. Yeah. But, you know, what? When, when I was talking about putting things in context, yeah. that era... There was an open mic all walking distance every single day in that in Lower East Side, side yeah. area. So, you know, I pretty much was saying the Norikans, the cream of the crop, because it was where everyone was focused. It was the most hardest to get a shot at. Uh -huh. And me, if a homeless guy walked by and the window was open at the Cyber Cafe where I was running my open mic, I would say, I'll put you on the list, but you have to come in. I can't pass the list through the window, so come on in. And so we were taking everyone who just wanted to be a part of the scene. Right, right, the, right. Was Jack like, Powers was an inclusive person like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And the venue, went, when the scene blew up in Cambridge, uh -huh. and it went from three venues in metropolitan Boston. Oh, yeah. We're talking the radius of, this, of the greater Boston area, yeah. Cambridge and then surrounding towns. There were basically three venues a week. Uh -huh. It was Stone Soup. It was uh, the Naked City Coffee House. I there see. was the Vienna Coffee House, but that was in Club Passines, but they were folk music. Uh -huh. And then there was uh, one on Beacon Hill that it had a humble crowd. Yeah. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's 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 the uh, begins with an A. It means artist space. Uh, oh, okay. L L. I forget the word. Anyway, and and that was pretty much it. Every week long, there was three open mics. Sure. One, Monday, Thursday, and uh, I forget what day the other one was but, on. But Steve was doing amazing stuff, and he had a real vision, and everyone really gave him accolades because of what Steve Cannon was doing. Yeah. Really, uh, you know, and... and it's uh, about giving people the voice. Yeah. And it's in the... the, the, uh, the When it went from the three venues to 30 in a week, yeah. in, that, in that wave... The Boston Globe came out and covered the explosion, and, and I got mentioned out of nowhere. And that is what launched the three chapbooks, which 20 years later is now that book right there. But wasn't there like the PBS series too, where they went all across the United States? I didn't know PBS has an open mic story series. From that era, because 
there were like camera open mic poetry it was like i don't know way, about this the, the, you know the remember the name of it it's like um st state of poetry this was it in florida no no was I, it out of connecticut who did it because uh, which whenever PBS you do P saying, P yeah. pbs sometimes is bought uh, uh npr is mostly true national true. But, but npr is washington based there were situations and there where are people, states with no npr and people PBS. were coming to my open mic saying that they wanted to shoot certain footage because of the national excitement of the poetry movement and i don't know what it was that was the catalyst for that, uh -huh. um, but it's just because it's the edge of democracy. Sure, it's every sure. it's every single Planet of the Apes movie where where the where the enslaved ape or the enslaved human, which were both muted, finally said the word no. If uh -huh. you watch all seven of those movies, uh -huh. and they're pretty simple stories. If you look at the novels and the paperbacks, you can go back and you can break them down into 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 literature of a certain uh, genre of fiction. And, sure. But really, the nexus of them, just like in the Hunger Games, yeah. there's a real hard truth at the center of that that you don't have to wait for. This is now. Yeah. You know, the Statue of Liberty buried in the sand. That's not about the future. And that, and, and, and look what that did to that guy who ended up uh, being the NRA guy, uh -huh. uh, the, the famous actor. So these are all really important stories. So open mic and the job of running an open mic. And I used to tell people because they wanted me to start one. Which in yeah, the last yeah. interview I talked about the human room open voice, so I'm going to leave okay. it on this one. But it's a project I started to to take that seed of the open mic and say there's no democracy on the internet. I'm going to make one, okay. and I'm going to. So that's another whole story. I'll get, we'll do, we'll go that later on. It's in sure, the last one. Sure. So, um, but it's really important that when you have when there's no voice left and no hope left, and it, and you talk about parents right now. And they're saying they're 15, 16, 17. You know how many times I've heard somebody my age is like, I'm really glad I'm old. Yeah. You, that, well, that's you know, not okay. That's not okay. I mean, imagine if you're a teenager and your parents are all saying, boy, I ain't got to live through these robots. I'll be gone by the time they take us over and chip us and enslave us. And, and parents are now getting a little complacent about these words leaving their mouths. When in the meantime, they're upgrading their phones and they're pressing that agree button. Have you ever read that? I wanted to do a podcast called the agree button. Have you ever read that? There is an agree button. Listen to this inside the Samsung upgrade, which is becoming oh, okay. more like Apple now. Yeah. And one of them, there's a there's a inside the, the privacy policy or other privacy policy you have oh, to click on to read yeah. another chapbook. Yeah. And another novel yeah. inside terms and conditions or other versions. And inside one of them, it literally said, "If this device kills you, it's your fault." Okay. It was in the wording. Sure. Was and, but you had to go like seven. You had to read it for about maybe half. If you're a slow reader, you're a half a day but into that's reading. That's a real before smart you turn person. your phone on. Yeah, that's a smart person who's no, wired up. Yeah, and is like yeah. If we get them to click this, that's on. not a sla That's not that is a slave system. Sure. You see, that's the whole thing. Is that the human room open voice idea? Which I again, I'm trying not to uh, cut into this conversation. Sure. Because it's in the last one. And inside it, I'm, 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 I don't like to use the word I and me, so, but I have to talk about it to give it away. Sure, sure. So um, the, it has a monetary art system. Okay. That doesn't exist. There's play money, and there's real money, and then there's the idea of Bitcoin, which is a new version of yeah. real money. Sure, sure. But that's real money. And, and then they got in bed with, with, uh, with Wall Street, so it's no longer a blockchain. It's no longer sure. of and for and by the people. Now it's of and for and by the old money yeah. taking over, and now they're going to own the digital world. Sure. And the, the zero and the one and the decimal point is still owned by people who rape, burn, and pillage the earth daily. Sure. But that monetary system, and I said this in the last one, and you disagree with me, please, uh, if you want. I but will. all civilizations and, uh, uh, need a fuel. Yeah. And all civilizations with a fuel need a monetary system to move that fuel in and out of the whoever owns the fuel system. Uh -huh. So if that's what's happening, then that triad is a monetary system. And that monetary system, in order to perpetuate itself, must produce slavery, war, 
and poverty in order to sustain itself. Yeah. Because that's what makes fear and that's what makes us as an animal species lose our, our ability to be poets and free thinkers and critical thinkers and questioners of reality and people who don't accept the, the, the you're supposed to be uh, standing on one leg. If you put your other foot on the ground, you're not one of us and we're going to kill you. So, Something as yeah, stupid as that. Like I, wrote, so, I wrote this amazing poem in a vacuum and I was like, this I really believe in. And then there was some poetry event that a government entity was sponsoring and I'm like, oh man, I got this great poem. It's poem in my pocket. Sonnet that's the name my, of it? Yeah, poem in my pocket, sonnet in my sock, hymn in my heart, song in my soul, poem in my pocket, do not read between the lines, lay down your weapons and open up your minds. Oh. Hey, what did you just say? Uh. Did you just say lay down your weapons? That's like there's commissioners who uh, would say that's uh, against the First Amendment the power, or, or yeah. whatever amendment. Or it you're is. not being a man. Uh, the right, no, the right to bear arms oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're saying lay down your weapons and I'm like that's not what I said I just went to New that's York that's not what I said no. I said metaphorically we need to drop our boundaries and we need to lay down our weapons oh no Chris we need another poem oh um, I have this great poem that talks about the aroma of the confederate jasmine it's like did you just say confederate and I was uh, like yes but confederate jasmine has nothing to do with the confederate right. army yeah it's like, the, it's, it's like it's a flower it's on a, a planet <laughs> of jasmine yeah. oh man we can't use that poem I go I have the perfect poem for you and it was just very did about you mean, nature <laughs> you know and, and it was safe and it's like Chris this poem is perfect and yeah. I'm like I know it is I know. because I did two strikes and now I'm gonna hit a home run uh, I'm not gonna strike out. so I to, not to say that what he just said was in the realm of compromise, which in a way I, 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 I'm, I'm going to call you out because I'm going to now I'm going to throw you a life preserver. Oh. So what I did is that I, when I published my first book, my poet, my peers, my open mic friends said, "You're too metaphysical, you're too complicated, and you're too deep, okay. and you're not making it accessible enough." So the only thing to do when somebody tells you that is write a poem about nature. And when you write a poem about nature, that's first of all, anyone could be a poem if you write about nature. That's it's right. pretty easy yeah. to do. But what happens is that unless people get the subtext, that the flower you're writing about is a homeless child, yes. that, the, uh, that, the, that the, the, the leaf that fell off the tree is, it was, was, uh, was not pushed off by the other leaves or winter, it just didn't belong anymore because the seasons of time changed. You can, you could, poets can work in the subtext of metaphor and put it in there, but it's up to the reader to see past the superficial sure. level. But the poem on a superficial level is safe. And that's not a compromise, but when you start writing about nature like he did, what happens is you learn how to weave the second and the third and the sure. fourth layer under that layer that if people only want to get it, because they understand it, because it's accessible, then you will be able to do that and write sure, a poem but then all of in us nature. Do. But then you get better at writing nature poetry until it has those levers. Am I, am I good with that? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, that analytical component brings it up to the level of Sound of Silence, 20th Century Fox, and you know those uh, lyrics that yeah. I was being invited to study in uh, my high school English class. It's like, there's more to this, but we presented it in a way that people were entertained once on the first listen. On the first level. But then when you l listen to it again, the, you hear the or next you level. get it with 30 other people and you all discuss it, then it's like it, you peel you back get, that onion. Yeah, and you get 30 yeah. opinions too, that's, 30 yeah. listens, that's but for sure. But still, it's... Joe it, said it, something about the difference between hearing and listening. That's in this. Uh, you got to watch it. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he nailed it. It was a grand slam yeah. line. But uh, he said, the uh, difference between hearing and listening, I go, what is it? And he said it. It was so common sense. It was a, oh, yeah. brilliant. I'm not going to repeat it because another episode back to watch. Yes. So um, the uh, other... Th oh, man, it made me forget. 
Yeah, that, that this has been fun, by the way. All well, these are, they're, everyone is different. This yeah. is a completely different I mean, different you're one. smiling the whole time. I'm I know. Oh, you're, that yeah. you're having fun. I, I Otherwise, you're oh, like yeah. a, a huckster. I am. A no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Charlatan. Yeah. No, the last one, man, we went deep. It's like S&M pedophile. It's like, oh my God, where are we going with this one? No, and, this I, and, I, and, I, and I just, I, I hung on This is a celebration, man. This is a celebration. There are beautiful minds all over, all around us. There are so many creative. And, uh, and and I got. Do, do you realize what it means to be the Florida Beat Poet Laureate and the connection of Kerouac and College Park? You're alone. <laughs> no, 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 no. Con you're, you're surrounded Kerouac, by Kero Jack Kerouac owned a house in College Park near Orlando, Florida, while he was writing the Dharma Bums, uh -huh. hot, hot Florida weather, he would take baths in ice water to cool off, and then he would write. He was writing Dharma Bums, then he gets communication that this book he wrote called On the Road is a bestseller, and suddenly yeah, yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. was the shit. And 11 years later, he was in Tallahassee, Florida, owning a home, and his mom, who only spoke French, he was taking care of her, and he bled out in the hospital at, um, at St. Pete. Yeah, uh, and, and the date. And, I have it in my poem. That's how I ended up here. To, but, the so, poem I have in this year's anthology is, is just four lines from a longer poem. Awesome. That I wrote when when uh, when the, who owns Jack Kerouac? Came sure, out. sure. That, so I'm in that documentary because my friend asked me to write a poem, and I said I don't write a poem because people ask me to, especially yeah. about a person. Yeah. And I went home, and it hit me, and I took Jan and Jack, and I made one poem, and I gave them both a voice in the afterlife, and I had them make up. Yeah. And and in that poem, uh, I, I mentioned something relative to what you just said. It's, yeah. it's, I'm not gonna and go back I, I invite mind. people to San Augustine, come to Florida, and um, and see. It's a little uh, vacation uh, town. I, sh I should get I should get a town. little I should get a little bus and get a little tour but of the then go a little a bit further and go see the Kerouac House. It's yeah. a it's a writing and residence. Uh, set up so you have to uh, apply and then you get awarded to go in that um, Cloister Avenue home and write and write and write and then at the end of your residency they have a poetry reading right there and you can share with everyone what you wrote with the spirit of Kerouac and pushing you on. But my wife and I, we went down there, and she's like, why you want to hop out right here and take your picture in front of this home? And I go, this is the Cloister Avenue home where Jack, you know, got famous. And then I said, I want to go That's to... That's where he was living when the phone rang. That's right. I want to go to the nearest coffee shop, and I bet you Jack walked to that coffee shop once and, or twice and hung out there, and I guess I really should have said, where's the closest bar? That's probably... <laughs> <laughs> where Kerouac was hanging out, but uh, you know, it's just like, man, you know, did Kerouac look at those trees, or how tall were those trees when he was walking up and down this residential area? And it's just like, you see, this you know. is the difference between inspiration and 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 and, and talking to Ron to yes. subvert this little thing here. Yeah. He said, um, and, and 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 this is going to sound like a repeat because I think I've brought this up almost in every single one. His mom taught him. Never look up to someone and never look down on anyone. And what happens when people say, who are your greatest influences? Uh, there is this thing that happens to you that I call, when you touch art, be very careful because art will touch you back. Yeah. And when art touches you back, the, the thing that got you to where you are, to, to find your voice, to be impassioned, to go for your voice, to, to follow the passion and the thing that led you there. Once you break through that thread and you do your open mic and you run the open mic and you run it for years on end and you give other people a voice and now you're here because That's you've right. done that, yes. that little seed of I looked up to Jack Kerouac and he influenced me was just, it, it, it wasn't, that was not it. The, the, the gift was that that was the thing that led you to the door and got yeah. you to put your hand on the knob and turn it and open it. Yes. But once you're on the other side of that threshold, yeah. then 
it's no longer that you were influenced. It's now that you are willing to become who and what you are and ask the hard questions of yourself. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side. That's what you did when you opened up the door, man. Yeah. There you go. The doors of perception. Yeah, the doors of perception. And I'll tell you, man, it's like, what kind of guy was Kerouac? What kind of guy was Bukowski? Um, you can Corso. debate it. You yeah. can debate it. But the fact is they wrote words that we read and it changed us. It, 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 it uh, affected us. Um, my wife is an accountant. I'm an artist. <laughs> she doesn't get poetry. She's gone to a lot of poetry readings to support what I'm doing and yeah. what I feel so passionate about. But she's breaking bread during this festival, uh, sitting with Ron uh, Whitehead. She's here? Catching up. Oh, I gotta meet her. She's catching up with Joe Kidd and Sheila Burke, oh. who came to our oh, house. Oh, that was what, wait till she Saint sees Saint all these. But, but they came to our house in St. Augustine, and Joe Kidd was my keynote speaker for my last oh. St. Augustine Poet Fest. And my wife gets to know about the human part yeah. of poets and thank are, you because that's kind of what this is exactly. this is but that's what i'm saying that's why that's why this is just yeah. a conversation yeah, because the, the human side of poets and you've made many references during this conversation about how people carry themselves and it's like i feel like where's the truth in this and and i spent 10 years of my um published poet career writing things that might have rhymed good that people might want to hear that would make people applaud and then someone said to me i respect you you're a poet and poetry is honesty i'm like i didn't know that i thought i thought this was a show you're gonna, you're gonna love yeah. you're gonna love these and then i too. said wait a minute it this pen up. has value this pen has weight maybe i should start telling my story instead of trying to entertain and if i put myself back together and make myself a whole person in this puzzle if i flip over that puzzle i'll see that the world has been put back together so while i'm putting myself back together the world takes care of themselves and my favorite I, line in the book is his own dry ink dying to speak back to him yeah and another line in, in another critical poem about that is the machine of art making did not own and breed him yes so if you fall into the fame or the entertainment yes. and and it's like, and this is why I, I, be, I wrote a poem at the very beginning of uh, how Slam and, and Beat collided uh -huh. with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Patricia Smith and Michael Brown bringing it from Chicago okay. into, into Jack Power's venue, who gave, who gave this brand new form a seat at the table and a, and a, and a space at the open mic, only for some dark shit to go down because business yeah. has moved into town. And it's not that 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 slam hasn't uh, done its thing, but it is a different seed in a different garden. It's a different tree. Yeah. But when that tree and those leaves fall, and there you become the national champion and the and the and the and the, and the international champion and the best slam poet in the world, and you're not a poet, you're a performance artist. Yes. And all these things are happening, and then there's a con there's no conflict. That wasn't it. It was meant to. It was meant that. Poetry was so underappreciated for so many of the wrong reasons. Yes. Because of basically the beginning of his story here in this in this interview, this conversation, yeah. is that it was it was the same thing that he wasn't attracted to, and then he saw the difference. People see the surface of something. I have I still have that with uh, with opera. I can't feel it. Uh -huh. I don't feel opera. It's just cerebral. It's yeah yeah sure the neurons are bouncing and I get it. And the octaves are up there, but it's so mechanical to me. It's too perfect. Okay. Where's the sloppiness? Where's the ugliness of life? Where's the where's that naked truth? It's and then the, so, the but it wasn't room. until it wasn't until almost two weeks ago when a friend of mine, Nell, who, who's uh, in the process of saying she's going to uh, actually in the process of, I think it's going to happen, translate my book into Latin. Wow. It's like, do you mind if I translate your book into Latin? She said, and I said, huh. yeah. 
Uh, I have no reason not to. It's like it would be the first translation, but why, why not? You know, if you want to do it. She goes, well, can I do this? Can I do that? I go, your name's on the translation. Go ahead. Uh -huh. But I was talking to her because she's also a classical musician, and, and she stepped away from it. She's about to step back into it with her grand piano and her full-time dedication of what it means. Okay. She goes, before you learn, because I'm writing lyrics now. I'm on a lyric kick. Wow. And, and she goes, before you do that, I want you to learn this thing. And she gave me these two words. Uh, she goes, you've got to listen to Bach, okay. and you've got to understand these four things. And basically, it's uh, understanding that there's like soprano yes. and alto and baritone and bass. I think those are the four things. And when Bach writes music, she said, you've got to understand that that's what's happening. Okay. That the song is being played at multiple octaves at that's the same true. time. And if you can't hear that, then you're not going to be as good as lyric writer. Because she loves my lyrics and she loves my basic songs. But she says, in order for it to be a real song... This is something you... So I'm listening to that for the first time. Kathleen handed me a Bach thing and on the way up here, and on my recorder on my phone, I started kicking some poetry on the way up here, and I had a, and I had an idea for two more manuscripts just by listening to it because it did something, but my heart was already developed. Yeah. So whatever it was doing to my mind as an artist, the cerebral understanding of the complexity of four-lane traffic and when they're, which lane are you listening to, they're all going the same way, and then can you notice when they cross and stuff like that. That's what she said you have to understand. And until I, and when I heard it, it was like, whoa, it was, it was a cerebral thing. I, I got it. It's like sure. my, my mind, my brain lit up, but my heart was listening. And that's what Ron talked about in the first yeah. one. It's so important. It's going to be, all these are going to tie together and they're completely different. Yeah. So this has really been brilliant, really brilliant and beautiful. Do you want to keep going? You got something new to say? No, I got right. get, I'm sleepy. Okay. <laughs> so we're good. So, uh, wow. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Definitely. Yeah. I wish you all the best. Well, you don't got to wait. It's like the same manure pile. We all end up in the same manure pile. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make some soil, eh? Okay. All right, yeah, better yeah. than sand. Yeah, and let the, let the worms crawl through us. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. You might get a tree out of it. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that tree a, will be a poet. Poetry. Yeah. Poetry. Da -da 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 -da. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.